Welcome to Major Keys and welcome to season two of Major Keys. The first season only took me two years to complete, but no worries, I will have more consistent content. So make sure that you are subscribed so that you get updates when those videos are dropped. Now, before we dive into this interview with my guest Vanessa Hutchinson from the NFL this week, let's talk about a major moment for women in sports this week. Kim Ang became the highest ranking female executive in baseball. She became the general manager of the Miami Marlins. And ladies, be careful. There's a lot of glass on the floor. Yes, we're so glad she has shattered another ceiling for women in sports. And I can't wait to see the women that come behind her from the path that she has blazed. Congratulations, Kim. Now let's dive into this interview with Vanessa Hutchinson. Check it out. Welcome to Major Keys. I'm here with Vanessa Hutchinson, the Senior Manager of Football Development at the NFL. Thank you for joining me. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing well. And yourself? I'm doing well today. Well, as of this recording, we are waiting for election day results. So, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been a day. I've been trying to be distracted, you know, working, all of those things. But um, glad to be here with you today um, and, and learn a little bit more about what you do and then your, you know, your journey in sports. So my first question for you is, can you give me your sports journey in 60 seconds? Yeah, right. absolutely. I'm going to put some time on the clock. All right. So we're gonna You're probably doing in under 60, so I'll, 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 I'll okay. test myself. I started working in football uh, when I was 18 years old. I'm going into my 11th season, uh, or in my 11th season this year, uh, working in football. Um, started off just as an interest, um, as an undergrad student at Boston College. Did four years there as a work-study student, doing recruiting, operations admin. Um, ended up being retained on after I graduated, so did three more years there full-time. Assistant to the head coach, football operations, recruiting, uh, kind of you name it. Uh, so I was at BC for a total of seven years. After that, I transitioned to the Cleveland Browns for, for a season as their football operations and player personnel coordinator. Uh, and then from there, went on to the league office and to the role that I'm in now. Which is, I mean, that's that's a quick journey. Like you said, it is under 60 seconds. So you didn't play sports growing up either? I, so I played sports. I played I played softball. I played soccer. I played tennis, um, but like never at a competitive level. I always liked going because I enjoyed the camaraderie. Like I enjoyed sitting on the bench and, you know, talking with everyone. <laughs> and that was kind of what I fell in love with was like the very much the team aspect. And I've definitely seen that play out in my career. Whereas um, as much as I love game days, you know, working on the team side of things, I very much love the day to day working with the players and the staff and the coaches and what that dynamic really is. And so I think I have less of a competitive spirit and more like, like the team aspect of things. Which, which is important. It's definitely important. What would you say the impact of sports? So maybe not growing up playing sports, but what has um, the impact of sports been on your career path? I mean, honestly, I, I, I'd say, you know, I'd say that I'd say, you know, it's, it's, it's a plus in that I worked for a few clubs that have had very, uh, not very winning seasons, if you will. <laughs> I've been in 0-16 situation. I've been in one win season, just, you know, when I was with BC. Um, but I think, you know, there's a resiliency in that, in that it's sure it's upsetting to have a, a season like that, but um, there's so much to be grateful for and like the opportunity to even just be working in football and to be with the staff that you're with. And so, you know, I would hope and I'd like to say that I was able to bring some of that positivity even in those tough moments, um, just enjoying being in the environment that I was in. I felt so fortunate to be so young and working with, the, you know, with incredible staffs and staffs have gone on to do great things with their careers. And so um, I think I'd always say, even though I've been in some 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 losing seasons, uh, I think I've always tried to bring, you know, what I do like about being in sports ultimately is that is that relationship that you have with everyone on staff. That's great. And every team needs to have, you know, someone who, who's coming in who's not that ultra competitive person, you know, somebody who's not always wrapped up in that. But who were your role models growing up? Maybe not in sport. Did you have any role models that show you the way? Absolutely. I mean, growing up, it was it was my older sister. I have, I have one sibling. It's my older sister. And she is she is the book smart one. She is the academic one. Uh, she is the Harvard grad. Um, and she kind of did her best, you know, kind of watching over me and making, I mean, I always want to do anything to make her proud. If I wasn't trying to make her laugh, I was trying to make her proud. And so she really pushed my butt academically. Um, you know, I, 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 
say, you know, one of the reasons I went to Boston College is because my sister made sure I was always keeping up on my academics um, and ultimately kind of helped put me in a position where I could take the reins at BC and try and figure my life out at that point. So my sister really was a big role model for me growing up. And then, you know, entering into the football world, you know, one of my greatest mentors um, is Reggie Terry. And, you know, I'm he's a director of football operations at BC now and had come from the Arizona Cardinals. Um, and he's like a second father to me. He uh, really, really helped me understand, um, you know, football and all dynamics of the front office, how it's run, how it should be run. Um, and, I, you know, my interest in football just grew from there, having just known him. When you were at BC, what made you want to be involved with the football program? So might be a little silly, but when you're in high school, they make you take those career aptitude tests and, and what, what should you be when you grow up and all these different things. And I, I kept getting sports agent. And that was the only response they had for anyone who kind of had answers geared towards sports. It always was sports agent. And then, you know, I watched Jerry Maguire and realized I don't think I wanted to do that, but I wanted to figure out a way that I could fit into that sports environment and football specifically. It was always my favorite sport growing up. And so, um, you know, for me, you know, deciding to go to BC, knowing they had this power five football team, just wanting to get involved. And, in, you know, I had no idea what a front office, how it was structured, where I might fit, you know, to me, it was just players and coaches. And I didn't know there was operations and there was recruiting and all these different areas I could get involved in. So ultimately, tried to use my undergraduate experience to really you know dig into that and see what I liked. And you've had you know a great career at a young age. Can you tell us a little bit about what your role entails now as the yeah. senior manager in football development? Absolutely. So I work a lot in our diversity, equity, and inclusion within the National Football League. Um, I work specifically in an area of uh, football operations under Troy Vincent um, and we call it um, our pipeline programming. And so I work with um, you know candidates, anyone who is outside the NFL and wants to work in the NFL all the way to people in the NFL who want to ascend their careers even higher. And so I work on development, networking, mentoring initiatives um, that we can put on as a league that we can invite them to and really let them, um, you know, attend and get the most out of so that they can get to where they want to be in their careers. So they have the opportunity to get to where they want to be in their careers. Um, so, you know, we start with entry level programs such as, you know, the Bill Walsh Diversity Coaching Fellowship, the Nun Wooten Scouting Fellowship, and those areas working with candidates who are just trying to get their foot in the door. Um, and we kind of build off of that and hit you know, different points of, uh, you know, different you know, levels, entry level within the NFL, mid-level, senior level, and put on different programming, you know, all throughout that. And one of those initiatives that you work on or helped start was the Women's Careers in Football Forum, um, which has been responsible for placing 97 women within um, football. What does that number represent to you? Yeah, I mean, 97 is a, is, a, is a great number and it's always growing. It seems like that number is always just getting bigger. And I think, I think it represents a lot of things. I think it represents the women we've been able to bring into the Women's Forum who have shown such resiliency, who have shown such a dedication to, you know, developing themselves and, you know, taking on, you know, internships or, or mentorship opportunities to just grow themselves and put themselves in a position where they can interview for these roles that they ultimately want to be in. Um, I think, you know, it really represents that, that we've brought in some great, great candidates um, that just so badly, uh, this is what they want. And, and they're really being patient and really sticking to that. I think it also represents, you know, the number of allies we have within college football and the National Football League and these, these clubs and these teams that are really grasping the importance of having women on staff and giving women the opportunity to interview for roles, um, you know, understanding that if you're not considering the entire candidate pool when you're hiring for a role, uh, you're really lacking and you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, I, I can't wait for the day where we, where there's too many to count and we, you know, it's, we don't have to focus on counting anymore because it's so normalized, but you know, that 97 number, it really is important. And it, it just shows, you know, all those women have, have, have earned those opportunities themselves. We've just put them in a room of people, you know, who, who should be interviewing them, but you know, they earned all that by themselves. And I think that's tremendous. You mentioned, you know, the diversity and perspective. Is there, are there any other reasons that, um, that you personally think that, you know, it's important for women to be a part of football? Yeah, I mean, if you look at college football now, um, the numbers, it still bewilders me because you can't count it. There are so many women that are working in college football um, at all different levels, whether that's recruiting, whether that's coaching, whether that's football operations. Um, and there's just so many candidates too many candidates that you can't ignore um, that are really, really qualified for entry level roles in the National Football League. Um, and, you know, to me, you know, what that ultimately means is there are some there are positions that open up in the NFL and we can't just consider just men for those roles. We have too many women. We have an overflow number of women working in you know, college football and even high school football that you just can't ignore that anymore. And you really need to consider the entire candidate pool, because if not, you are missing out 
um, you know, on some really skilled people and the, and the teams that embrace, you know, the opportunity to diversify their front office, um, you know, I think they see the value in it. And those other teams that aren't doing it um, are at a disadvantage. There is a lot of value in diversity. And right now in our country, there's a huge conversation about diversity and hiring practices. As a woman of color, how are you lending your voice to the conversation? I think what's been great about my role at the league office um, is just the connection that I have to all 32 clubs. Um, my role primarily focuses on diversity within those, those front offices of those 32 clubs. And we've been able to develop a relationship um, you know, that, that is a very good working relationship. And we've had clubs that just have reached out and say, hey, we wanna do diversity programs within our organization. We don't really know where to start. We have an idea of what we wanna do. Um, can you help us out a little bit? And I think it's been great that clubs have felt comfortable to call upon our department, um, lean upon us, you know, me, myself, being able to give my opinion, add my voice, um, even, you know, suggest great candidates that they could potentially consider. Um, I just think that's just a tremendous opportunity in itself to just have that conversation face to face with the clubs um, and, and to really be a part of those initial conversations for those clubs that are just starting out, but have realized that it's an important factor for them. And so for me, I think that's been tremendously valuable, tremendously rewarding. Um, and, you know, I, it means a great deal to me. So what do you hope the league looks like in 10 years, given all of those different things? I hope I hope a lot of things. I, I hope the number of, you know, minority, you know, members of a front office is, is much higher than it is now, that it's more equivalent to matching the number of, you know, players of color that we have, you know, on, on, on teams, matching it to the front office and making that more equivalent and more balanced. I hope that, again, we don't have to count the number of women that are in a front office anymore, that that is just normalized. And I think the, the, the biggest piece is normalization. In 10 years, I really hope that that is all, you know, progressed very, very well. Um, and, you know, the other thing is you have so many young coaches, young scouts in the league right now, and who knows where they'll be in 10 years. But those ones that are currently with clubs that are embracing diversity and inclusion already, that are embracing people of color, that are embracing women, I hope they take their experiences from where they are now. And as they ascend in their careers, they continue to see the importance of that and they continue to grow their front offices as well. Absolutely. Well, my last question, I asked of all my guests, what is a major key that you would give to young women, young girls who would like to achieve in the industry of sport? I think, you know, the best suggestion I can make is really identifying your allies within the sports industry. And that can be people you know and people you don't know. That can be a mentor that you've had. That can be a peer that you work with in one of your roles. That can be someone on LinkedIn that you found that has a role that you're really interested in and you want to connect with them. Um, building those allies and building that network is really the foundation of, of especially an industry like football and that business of, you know, who you know, but I've, I've, you know, just speaking from experience, I found taking advantage of those conversations, um, asking the questions that I want to ask and, 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 and learning from people who've already been in those positions um, has been, you know, the most tremendous experience for me because it's allowed me to grow so much uh, quicker. It's allowed me to have perspective, um, you know, ones that differ from my own, which is really important. Um, and it's allowed me to learn how to network early and grow that network through the people that you've already allied with. And so, you know, it's hard to start a network sometimes, especially if you feel like you don't know where to start. But it, honestly, reaching out is the biggest thing you can do. And, and you know, it, someone will respond, even if you don't know them. There are people that don't, but there are certainly people that do and that want to help. And I think you really need to go for it and look for those people. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining me. Um, I can tell that you are definitely one of those people who is willing to you know, sit down to talk or uh, to help someone grow their network, even just by sitting here um, and making an impact. But I thank you for your time. Um, and I look forward to all that you achieve in your role. But um, in, you know, again, you've achieved so much at a young age. I can't wait to see what is in store for you in the future. Thank you so much for having me. I greatly appreciate it. It's been an honor. Thank you again to Vanessa Hutchinson for joining me this week. And again, congratulations to Kim Ng. And before you go, I wanted to share a quote from a book that I finished this week, The Alchemist. Tell your heart that the fear of suffering is worse than the suffering itself and that no heart has ever suffered when it goes in search of its dreams because every second of the search is a second's encounter with God and with eternity. How true is that? How beautiful is that? I hope that as you go through the next week that you will continue to pursue the dreams that you have and not let the fear of failure or the fear of suffering keep you from doing what you know in your heart you were meant to do. Make sure you like, subscribe, and follow me on social media. I look forward to seeing you here next time on the next episode of Major Keys.